Good morning. All right. It's so nice to have all of you here, whether you come regularly or if you're a guest. If you're a guest, we just want to do everything we can to help you feel comfortable. If I invited you over to my home, my family would know that we want to give you the best seat. We want to help you know where things are. We want to answer any questions. We want you to be comfortable in our home. And I would say the same thing is true. When you come to God's home, we want to do everything we can to make you feel comfortable. So if you have any questions, we would love to answer those or help you in any way we can. One thing we would love is if you would take a moment and fill out a connection card from the uh, seat back in front of you, just your name, phone number, that kind of a thing. All we want to do is we just want to be able to reach out to you and go, hey, thank you so much for being here. If you have any prayer requests, we want to be praying for those. But we also just want you to know how you could contact somebody if you need help or if you have questions in the future. Uh, I just want to clarify one thing because there's been some confusion this morning. Uh, that was not a member of ZZ Top playing bass. That was our own Joe Druga. Okay. Yeah. Somebody asked me, where did we get the money to bring in ZZ Top? And I went, no, 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 no. Okay. So I just wanted to clarify that real quick. Hey, a couple of things I want to make you aware of is uh, next Sunday morning at 1145, we are having just a welcome to KCC lunch. So if you're new, if you've been here less than a year or so, and you just have questions either about the church uh, or about how to get connected, we just want to do everything we can to help you. So 1145, it'll be in the fellowship hall downstairs. We'd love to have you there. If you are like me and you are uh, 50 and above, uh, we want to uh, just invite you to the uh, Fabulous 50, which will be next Saturday night, 630 both of those, you can get more information in your bulletin, okay? I am uh, just uh, super excited to do what I'm about to do next, and that is I get to introduce Kathleen Albert, so I'm going to ask her to stand up. Okay? I started with Kathleen because you always start with the best, and then you just kind of go from there, okay? Uh, so next, uh, we also have John Albert here, and I love that uh, John and Kathleen are here this morning because it's kind of that thing from Luke chapter 15, you all always want to celebrate when the lost come home. Okay, so uh, we are super excited to have John come and uh, share with us and tell us a little bit about what they're doing, but also just to uh, preach and share God's word with us. So let's give him a warm KCC welcome. Thank you very much. Not all who wander are lost. I haven't been lost. I know where I was at every time, just not where I was going. <laughs> oh, it's so great to be here. It's so great to see all of you. It's um, Kathleen and I was blessed to hang out with you guys. This is, this is home. This is family. And, and it's just a delight to see you all. So hi. Hi to everyone. <laughs> Good to see you. We will not get to spend as much time with each of you, obviously, as we'd like to. But um, it's just, it, is, it really is a treasure to be here. It's super great. So but not just from Kathleen and I, our whole family says hello and they love you, um, and our family is growing. It's incredible. We're now grandparents. How cool is that? So I, we are very excited to be part of that club, and I do have the right barber for that. Um, yeah, it's, it's great, and uh, so our granddaughter, Juliet, is a, almost a year old, and then, uh, and then we have a second one on the way, so uh, that's, this is still Miranda and Hunter. Um, so our next grandchild is due in September, so we're about to be twice the grandparents we've ever been before, and uh, it's so very exciting. And then Monty, he decided that it was time for him to grow up, so he got engaged, and uh, about stinking time, because she's fabulous, and, so, and, and she just looks like another one of our daughters, so another blonde young lady is coming into our family, and they're getting married in October, which is super great, and as we speak here, he's actually right now in Tucson playing drums in a worship band in a church there, so that's cool. And then, uh, and then Melody, who's now 19 and in college on a college rodeo team, and she's in Texas this weekend rodeoing. So, um, so they, all, they all say hello, they all say they love you, and, um, and would love to be here, but we get to be here, so that's, that's great. Um, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 today. If you want to grab your Bibles and go there, that'd be great. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 is what we're going to focus on once we finally get there. Uh, but let's, let's have a word of prayer together first. So, Father, you're awesome. We love you. You're an amazing, incredible God who loves us, who redeems us, who gives us life. You knit us together. You breathe life into us. You lead us. You direct us. You save us. We come to you, Father, because of your invitation, not because it is our right to be in your presence, but because you invite us by the precious blood of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. And, 
And so, Lord, we humbly come before you. We surrender our mind and our heart to you, uh, that you would lead and direct us, that you would be the one teaching, uh, that we would be eager to listen, eager to obey. We know that your word is alive and active and sharper than double-edged sword, and we know that it never returns void. So, we're excited about what you're about to do in this moment uh, because your word is just so awesome and you're amazing and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So there was, a, there was a moment when a young man came to Jesus and asked him a question and the heart of this young guy was not really out of curiosity. He was trying to look to be able to get by with as little as he wanted to, right? He asked a question. Of course, none of us have ever done that. We've never tried to get by, as, but this guy did. So I don't know if you can relate. But he came to Jesus and said, hey, what are the great, what's the greatest commandment, right? And so Jesus, seeing right through him, like went right to the heart, and he said, well, here's, here's the deal. Here's the greatest commandment. Love God, love others. That's it. Everything else hangs off of that. Everything else is based on that. All my other commands, all promises, anything I've ever said has to deal with that. And so it's very true of all of Scripture. All that we read, every command that he gives us, every promise that he gives has something to do with how we love him, and then as an expression of loving him, we love each other. The same is true for what we're about to read here in Matthew chapter 5. And so just a little bit of background and context to, to Matthew chapter 5, it's a part of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I doubt, I doubt Jesus, you know, titled it that way. I don't think he was sitting alone in the wilderness trying to figure out, I got this great message, I have no idea what to call it, what's a good message? But I mean... He steps onto this mountain, right, and speaks to everybody, and some wise individual, really creative, says, oh, that's the Sermon on the Mount. So that's what we call it, and it happened at really the height of Jesus' popularity. So leading up to this massive sermon that he proclaimed, he was doing all kinds of miracles, and he was earning the right to be heard. He was proclaiming testimony of who he is by what he did first. He was, he was serving people, he was washing feet, he was saving people, he was redeeming people, he was rescuing people, he was helping the lame to walk, the blind to, that would be here, or no, see, the deaf to hear, I'll get it right, you know what I mean. So he's doing all these things, and it's all about earning the right, and his popularity is growing, then in the midst of that, then he steps out and goes, now that I've got your attention, let me speak. That in itself is a great example for us. Right? He was earning the right to speak before he spoke to the masses. We've got to do the same. Right? We need to live in a way that earns the right to speak to others. If we're not living in a way that examples God's love and his mercy and his grace, and we try to talk, it's like, you might as well just be quiet because they're not listening. Right? So this is what he does. is this great example for us. And then in that moment, he steps in and he begins the sermon with uh, what we now call the Beatitudes, all right? That's kind of how we know them. And so there's the blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are merciful, that are hunger and thirst for righteousness, and so on and so forth. And he uses this, this language, and this is verse 3 of chapter 5, and he simply says, blessed are the poor in spirit. All right, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's a simple little phrase, but honestly, it's, it's something that takes some time to try to figure out, well, what does that even mean? Like, these are terms that we use, and it's just kind of Christianese. But we've got, this, we've got this group of people that are labeled as the poor in spirit. We'll get to them in a moment, right? And these people that are defined as being poor in spirit, there's two things. They're blessed, and theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, what is that? So let's think about being blessed first, right? You know, I don't know how many of you feel like this morning you feel blessed. I hope you do, Right? But what, what, do we, what do we mean by that? Like, these are phrases we throw out. Like, in the, in the South, we use the word blessed as an excuse to gossip, right? As long as you say, oh, bless their heart, you can say whatever you want about them, right? <laughs> did you see what Betty did? Oh, bless her heart. She, right? It's like, this, it's like this blanket excuse to gossip, and you get away with it. It's fine. But up here in the Midwest, we use it oddly, too. It's like, I remember asking, you know, people, it's like, hey, how are you doing today? And then you get this, oh, I'm too blessed to be stressed, you know? And, and it's like, well, what does that mean? It's like, <laughs> And then as soon as they start praying, they're like, Lord, help me. I'm so worried. But, and we throw, we throw these words around, and we're like, do we even know what they mean? Like, what does it mean to be blessed? And there are those who would take this word, and they'll even, like, like try to make the Bible more, like, modern, like the whole message Bible. God, I just hate that thing. If you have one, drop, kick it to me. Whatever. So, sorry. But, like, this, like they'll, they'll just say, oh, happy Really, are you satisfied with happy? Anybody in here just sat? That's just, bleh. Like, don't settle for happy. There's so much more in life than happy, right? Blessed does not just mean happy. Yes, that's a part of it. 
you know, to say happy are those that are poor in spirit. And that's, that's a piece of it, but there's so much more to it. It's, it's kind of like thinking like, okay, I'll, I'll, everybody, here's a little exercise. Go back to kindergarten class. Are you ready? Picture an apple in your head. Go ahead. Can you do it? How many of you pictured green? Okay, y'all weird. All right, so red. Let's go red. Right? Okay, so you picture an apple. Now, when you're looking at an apple, it's got this peel on the outside. Is that the apple? Like, is that all it is? No. Well, if you think that's the only thing that the apple is, that's like saying the only thing blessed is, is happy are these. Like, there's more to it, isn't it? Like, beyond the peel, there's this flesh in there that's kind of juicy and, and, and it's nice. But, but even that, like, if you were to bite into the apple, there's, that's like going a little beyond the peeling. But it's still, there's more. I mean, okay, it tastes good and, and maybe it satisfies a little hunger. But there's, there's a little more in there, isn't there? Like, what's at the middle of the apple? Seeds, right? So the ultimate purpose, the ultimate intention of the apple is not to look good, although it does. It's not to taste good or satisfy hunger, but it does. But the ultimate purpose of the apple is to do what? Make more apples, right? I mean, it's, it's to reproduce itself. So if we think about that in the context of being blessed, blessed the same way. There's so much more than just being happy. Like, to really be blessed, we can't just, like, see something or recognize something. We have to, like, step into it. Like, get into it. Because the ultimate, the ultimate purpose of being blessed or having a blessing, what God is talking about here, is it ultimately continues to reproduce blessing in our life. It's not just a single moment. They're like, oh, that was blessed. And now I'm not. Oh, now I am. Like, it's... It's, it's something that continues to reproduce in us and pour over into other people. Maybe another example. So a number of years ago, I don't know, close to 20, coaching football here at Kimball, and we're at BBE, and of course we won because I was the defensive coordinator. And so we're there, and, and the game, you know, great game, we win the game, but it's one of those like 37, 38 degree rains. I mean, it's just miserable. I mean, you begin to question our sanity. Like, why do we do this? Why do we go in this kind of weather and chase around this little, like, oblong leather thing? It makes no sense whatsoever. And so the game's over. I am, I'm just soaked. I'm cold. Long before the days of us having a cell phone. So I get back to the high school here. Kathleen's at home with our two kids at the time, you know, holding down the fort. And I, we get back there. We get everything taken care of. I'm still just freezing cold, wet, all this kind of stuff. I call Kathleen. Hey, we won. It was great. I'll be home in a little bit. And, I'm, by the way, wow. I'm miserable. This is just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm a wreck, right? So I then, we were living up by Carnelian Lake at the time, so we drive up there. I drive, I drive up there, and I get in the parking lot, or parking lot, there's no parking lot, driveway, <laughs> right? And I go, and I go to the front door, and as I open the door, like, I smell fresh food, and Kathleen is standing there with sweatpants and a sweatshirt she just pulled out of the dryer. Like, hello, wife of the universe, <laughs> It's why we have three children. So, it, oh, sh I shouldn't say that, should I? So anyway, right? It's, I mean, talk about amazing, right? I mean, that's incredible. But in that moment, I could say, wow, I'm blessed, but not, not fully yet. I mean, if I want to, like what God is trying to communicate here, if I'm going to be blessed in that, it's, I'm not fully engaging that until, like, I'm eating the food, I'm putting the sweatpants and sweatshirt. I mean, I'm like, I'm stepping into it and I'm enjoying it. Like, it's, it's, a, it's now, I'm now in it. I'm in a part of it. I'm not just observing it. I'm not just recognizing it, right? But I enter into it and experience. That's the blessed that Jesus is talking about. This group of people are blessed. They're not just happy. It's not just superficial. It's not on the outside. It's not a fleeting moment. But it's, it's the people that are invited into and get to fully embrace, fully encounter the fullness of God and enjoy it. That's blessed. And it continues to, like, build inside of them and it continues to reproduce blessing and, and, and beyond happy, beyond the circumstances. And it spills over into others around. And then we've got this group of people that not only are the, is, does Jesus say these are the blessed people, right, the poor in spirit, they're the ones that are blessed. But it also says that these are the people that theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That sounds poetic. That's nice. I'm like, but what does that mean? Is, does that mean, well, they're the only ones that, like, go to heaven? Like, is that what he's talking about? Well, I think to, to maybe get a better understanding of it, we just continue in his sermon. 
Right? Like, go a little deeper into the Sermon on the Mount. And we get to the, the sixth chapter of Matthew in verse 33. And Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. And the all of these things are the verses from like 25 into that, like previous, where he's talking about, hey, stop with the worry thing. Like, throw worry, throw anxiety away, because I got you. Right? Okay, that's Albert paraphrase, but it's in there. So, like, he's like, I'm going to take care of it. Stop worrying about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear or where you're going to live or all these different worries of the world. Like, that's what the pagans do. That's what the people who don't know me do. They, they sit and spin and can't sleep at night because they've got all these concerns and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, that's not you. I'm too big for that. I got you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm with you. And, and he says, all I want you to do is seek me. Because we've got to realize that ultimately when he says seek the kingdom of God, which is the same as in chapter 5 verse 3 where he says is the kingdom of heaven, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, we've got to recognize that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is first and foremost a who. It's not a where or a what. It is the person of God. It is Jesus. When, when John chapter 1 verse 14, it says that the word, that which created absolutely everything, became flesh and made his dwelling among us, Right, So Jesus comes and walks among us, and he looks at all of us, and one of his messages is, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I am the kingdom of heaven. Right, So he's telling us, seek me. Run after me. Know me. If you're with me, if you're in my presence and you know me, you are in the kingdom of God. You don't have to wait until you die. Now, it's going to be way better when that happens. Trust me. Well, not that I've been there. But... Right? It's going to be way better. But we don't have to wait for that. Because God came to us. We don't have to try to make it to him. Right? Because we can't. Right? It's not, it's not our effort to get to him. And he knew that. So God says, y'all can't get to me. So I'm coming to you. So he says, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he says, who are the people that I listen to? Who are the people that I sit with? It's the poor in spirit. Isaiah chapter 66 it says that the, the people with a humble and contrite heart are the people that he looks to and the people that he hears. How cool is that? I mean, don't, do we not all of us want to be, like, counted as, hey, God looks to me. Like, if he needs something, he, he, he looks to me. He's got confidence in me. He, he hears what I have to say, right? Well, to do that, we're supposed to be, it is the poor in spirit are the ones that, like, he hangs out with. But he, he goes for walks with. I think he probably plays basketball with. I'm not entirely sure. But he, he's with. Like, he, they do life together. Right? These are the people. So now they're blessed, and they get the kingdom of heaven. Right? And who are these people? The poor in spirit. Well, who is that? What does that mean? It's kind of an odd phrase, isn't it? Anybody here really eager to be poor? Anyone? Uh, like, you got up this morning, Lord, my journey today is I want to be poor. <laughs> Like, none of us. That's, we don't want to be poor in anything, right? So what is he calling us to? What, is, what does this mean when he says poor in spirit? Well, we could just say humble because that's accurate. It's the humble, right? The, the contrite, meaning the repentant, the ones that confess him, the ones that bow before him. I mean, that's, that's it. But I think, there's, I think there's even more there than just to just say, well, it's those that are, that are humble. Because honestly, I'm guilty of maybe misrepresenting what humble is. Right? Or humble looks like. Even wrote, it's my favorite thing ever. I wrote a book about how humble I am. It's fabulous. Y'all should buy it. So it's called Humility and How I Achieved It. It's a great book. You should get it. So, but it's like, that's not true at all. So, but it would be cool. Um, but what, what, is that, what does that mean? So there's three different phrases really that I think I'd like us to kind of think through when it comes to trying to define or understand what does it mean to be poor in spirit. And these three phrases I want us to think about is, I don't want it, I don't need it, and I don't deserve it, all right? We're all guilty of all those things. We've all said that to people at some point in time for one reason or another. I don't want that, or I don't really need that, right? Or I don't deserve that. And so when we try to define pure or poor in spirit and what humble is, obviously one of the enemies we have to address is arrogance. Like arrogance is an enemy of, of humility or self-centeredness and is an enemy of humility or an enemy of being poor in spirit. So those that are the, the arrogant mind or the self-centered mind says, I don't want that to God 
Maybe for a number of reasons. Maybe it's because I don't want that, right, because I don't trust you. I'm angry with you. I'm upset with you. I don't want whatever you have. It might be, I might recognize that it's good and that, that it would be better for me, but I just don't want it because it's coming from you. I don't want that, right? That's a, that is not a poor in spirit. That is a, a selfishness and arrogance. There's this, there's this wall for one reason or another that we've decided to put up against God because we've judged his performance and he didn't pass, right? And we just go, I don't want it. I know what you're trying to offer. I don't want it. And then maybe there's a time where we would look at God and say, I, you know, Lord, I'm good. I don't need what you have. I don't need it. I mean, I've got everything I need. I mean, look at this specimen. Hello. Thank you for laughing. Right? Clearly, I don't need you. I got all the strength I need. I got all the wisdom I need. I mean, we have used enough science and technology to prove that you don't exist and you're not needed, so I just don't need you. Stay wherever it is you think you are, and I don't even know if you are, but I don't need you, right? Well, if we're going to stand in the face of God and say, I don't want you or I don't need you, of course, we have just kicked being blessed to the curb, and we have also just forfeited our opportunity of the kingdom of heaven, right? All that he's trying to give. But then there's also another thing that we have to be honest with when we think about being poor in spirit because it's not just an arrogance that can be self-centeredness. There's also a victim mentality that is just as self-centered but oftentimes carries the veil of looking like humility to say, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve what you've given God. I'm too terrible. I've done too many bad things. You can't possibly rescue me. You can't possibly deal with my problems. You can't possibly deal with all that I have been or all that I've done or all that's going on. I have done, I have been so far from living according to your word. I don't deserve it. And we use it as a means to push away and not step into his blessing and forfeit the presence of him. Right? But boy, that can look like humility. Oh, I just don't deserve it. Right? But these are things that are enemies of that. But the pure in heart, right, and the poor in spirit, they stand before God and they don't say, God, I don't want it. They say, God, I want all of it. I want all of it. I want every piece of it. I want all that you have to give. I want all of your wisdom. I want all of your love. I want all of your grace. I want all of your mercy. I want all of your power. I want all of your purpose. I want all of your intentionality. I want all of your vision for my life. I want it all. That is the poor in spirit. I want it all. Right? And and the poor in spirit stand before God and go, I need it. I need everything. And here's the amazing thing. That's all God does. He doesn't know how to give part. (laughs) When he gives, it's the whole thing. It's like, here it is. All of it. Like, he created everything. It's finished. It's done. He's on the cross. What did he say? It's finished. It's all done. There's nothing more to pay. There's nothing more to do. It's all done. Peter tells us that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. If you are in Christ, take the word more and kick it away and never use it again because that's not you. You don't need more. You've got it. Because that's all God knows how to do. But the poor in spirit are the ones that recognize it and see it and say, God, I need it. I want it and I need it. Let me have it. Because they're also the ones that use the same last phrase, but with a different understanding. They also say, I don't deserve it. But it's not a victim mentality. It's a, I don't deserve it, gratitude. I don't deserve it, and so I am so grateful. I could never save myself. I could never fix my problems. I don't deserve to be repaired. But God goes, yeah, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because that's, that's what I do. See the difference? The poor in spirit. But the beauty of how God works is he says first and foremost, remember the two commandments. He says first and foremost, we do that with him. We learn, right? We learn how to do that with him and we say, God, 
I want to be poor in spirit. I want all that you have to give. I need all that. I don't deserve any of it. But then from that place, from that place, he then opens our eyes to the people around us. And we learn how to do that with each other. Right? Because we do this with each other. I mean, imagine if Kathleen, in that evening, brought that. I open the door and I see her and I go, I don't want that from you. I don't want that. I don't want, I don't want you to serve me like that. What does that do? Can you imagine? We would only have two kids. Right? But, I mean, what a horrible moment. What a horrible moment. Right? Or if, if I were to say, I don't, I don't need that. I'm good. I'll just stand out here in the rain and be cold and miserable. I don't, I don't need that. Or if I were to see that and go, man, I've been so terrible to you. I've neglected you. You're a, you're a coach's widow. I've been, I, I don't deserve that. Man, that, we would have lost out entirely. But because when we, when we first and foremost learn how to drop before God, pour in spirit and say, God, I want you. I need all of you. I don't deserve any yet. But then we just we, we open that up to each other. We open that to each other and I say, and, and, I, and I look at Kathleen and I said, I want all that you've got to give. Whether I, whether I think I need it or not, I just want it because you're awesome, you're amazing, and I thank you. I need your love. I need your presence. And I don't deserve you to do this to me tonight. I left you alone with the two kids so I could go coach. I don't deserve it. But I'm going to embrace it. We take what we learn by our pursuit of God. And we spread it to the people that are around us. And all of a sudden, we are blessed. Not just happy. Not just circumstantially kind of up and down. But blessed. We step into it. And it re reproduces blessing in our lives. And it spills over into blessing into other people's lives. And it just continues. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Lord, we love you. And we're grateful for you. We don't deserve you. Yet you come anyway. From a place of humility. A place of being poor in spirit. We surrender and say, I love you. I want all that you have. I need all that you have. Not because I deserve it, but because you love me. And I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church. Thank you, worship team. Wow. That was awesome. You know, these guys, this is all volunteer time that these people up here in the worship teams do, and we sure appreciate that. Um, you know, it's, we just don't show up on Sunday and it happens. So there is some time that gets devoted to this, and we do it all for the glory of God. So we thank, thank everybody for that. I got a question for you, church. Have you ever asked God to examine you? In Psalm 139, David does exactly that. He writes, O oh Lord, you have examined me and you know me. You're familiar with all my ways. Examine me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Find out if there's any evil in me and guide me in the everlasting way. David is inviting the Lord to make a thorough examination of him deep down inside to explore, to dig, to probe his inner being down where unspoken thoughts dwell and unstated motives hide out in secret. And he invites God's searchlight. Now David goes even further. He asks the Lord to put him to the test so as to discover any distracting thoughts. In other words, he's saying, find out which thoughts carry me away from fellowship with you, O God. Show them to me so that I can understand them and their effect they have on my walk with you. David finally states that it's his desire to be led in the everlasting way, meaning the path of righteousness. He wanted to be a man of God, regardless of the cost. So do you want to be a person whose walk with God is intimate and deep? As we prepare to take these elements this morning, we're reminded of what it says in 1 Corinthians 11:28. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. 
So ask God to examine your heart and reveal which of your thoughts deep down inside carry you away from him. So this morning, if you're visiting with us, you're invited to share in the elements with us as long as you've accepted the Lord as your Savior. So let's pray. Father God, you've looked deep into my heart, and you know all about me. Don't let me follow the evil ways, but guide me in the way of your everlasting love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.